we are this week in Parshat Vayetze. Parshat Vayetze. And he went. And he went. Let's take the greatest book ever written and make our declaration. Hafokba, hafokba, the kolaba, hafokba, hafokba, mashiachba. Turn it and turn it for everything is in it. Turn it and turn it for the Messiah is in it. And our next declaration for every good and acceptable sacrifice, there is a divine response. So in Parshat Vayetze, you know, the, the thing that everybody, when they think about this part of the Torah, the thing that immediately people go to is Jacob having his dream, right? And seeing the ladder that came down out of heaven and extended to the earth and the angels going up. And and the Gospel of John and the Basora of Yochanan, Yeshua said, you think you've seen things? Like I'm kind of paraphrasing. You will see the angels of God coming up and down on the Son of Man. And that is a reference to the dream that Yaakov had. I want to start with taking a look at Isaiah 41, 18. This, is, this week is, I'm not going to talk about the latter. I'm going to talk about a stone and a bride. And if this had been back in the 60s or early 70s, that would have a different meaning. Isaiah 41, 18, I will open up rivers on the barren hills and wells down in the broad valleys. I will turn the desert into a lake and dry ground into springs. I'll tell you what, we could use some of that. I had an experience yesterday. I'm going to be very careful. My wife knows already what I'm talking about. I had an experience yesterday. I saw something in this area that I never thought I'd see. And I'm not going to say what it is right now because we're online. I was so shocked and so hurt, deeply hurt by what I saw. It took me about 35 minutes to drive home yesterday from where I was. And I just sat there in silence. No music. I'm always listening to music. Nothing. Just shock and hurt. It had nothing to do with me. Nobody said anything to me. It's just, I'm going to tell you all, we are in trouble. We are in trouble trouble. America is turning into a vast, vast wasteland. And the wasteland is growing. You know, the wasteland is growing. What do I mean by the way? I'm not talking about the ground. I'm talking about the spiritual landscape. It's like the old saying goes, we are going to hell in a handbasket. Our nation is so corrupt. Our nation is so sin sick. And I'll tell you, it's affecting our young ones in a horrible, horrible, horrible way. Talk about degradation. I mean, I... I told Darlene yesterday, I said, I, I don't even know how to handle this. I was so distraught. Never thought I'd see what I, but anyway, we'll get back to that. I, I'll tell you after we're off of that. So that you will know the seriousness of what's going on in the area. I'm sure some of you have seen it. It's my first time. And we also know how we've got to pray and how we've got to reach out. So this week... Parshat Vayetze, and he went out. There are six now six Parshiot left until we close out the book of Genesis, and then we begin the book of Shemot, Exodus. And in these last six Parshiot, 
the foundation is really being laid now for the nation of Israel. Started with Abraham, continued with Isaac, and now with Jacob and a series of events that take place, you see that it's really going to start to take place. And the emphasis from here on out is going to be on the life of Jacob with a few interludes with his children. And the thing about his children, unlike Abraham and unlike Isaac, Jacob's children were completely devoted to the vision of God. Now, you may be thinking, wait a minute. They sold their brother to Egypt. And they fussed. And, yes, they did. But the thing is, they didn't know the entirety of the vision. All they knew was they were called and chosen for a purpose. And if you stand back and you look at it from the brother's point of view, yeah, Joseph kind of seemed to be tripping everything up. They didn't have the whole picture. And God had planned out everything that had happened anyway. Okay? So they messed up a lot. There was a lot of strife among the brothers and everything else, but they were still committed. They still were committed to the uh, plan of God. They just didn't know anything. And until right before Jacob's death, they knew very little. And right before Jacob died, he said, all right, this is what is going to begin taking place, and this is what you're going to see in the end of days. And like Abraham and like Jacob, uh, um, sorry, Isaac, he was kind of a combination of the two of them. Abraham was very compassionate, very much a man who would go out and he would talk to people about God. Isaac was more, I'm going to stand my ground, and Isaac was a man of great strength. And you see both of those taking place in the life of Jacob. And, and so with that commitment and strength, that's why Israel is called the house of Jacob and not the house of Abraham, because that's really where everything started getting real firm. In Parshat Vayetse, we see that he got married. Bless you. He got married. He had children. He grew wealthy. Things were going pretty well in some instances. In some instances, things were going very difficult. And he did all of this with all this trouble and everything else away from home and away from his family. Now, I'm thinking about two of his sons who ended up leaving home and family. We know one of them was Joseph. Who was the other one? It was Judah. Judah. Very interesting. Jacob left home and family, and he became a changed man. Joseph and Jacob left home and family, and they became a changed man. Now, I'm not saying we should leave home and family, but the thing about Jacob, I'm sorry, the thing about Joseph and Judah, if you look at what the sages of Israel say, from Joseph comes the suffering Messiah, and from Jacob is the Messiah who is victorious. But we all know, yeah, Jacob, uh, Joseph suffered, but he was also victorious. Yeah, David was victorious, but, well, he also suffered. So we know that Mashiach ben David and Mashiach ben Yosef are one and the same. He's just coming again to take up that other role. So... Um, Jacob had the commitment, but his commitment had to be tested. There was no way out. And, you know, I, I talked last week about no options. There were no options for him. He had to take everything that was coming his way. So I want to take a look at Genesis 28, verses 10 to 11. Jacob left Beersheba and, came, uh, and set out for Haran. He came up on a certain place and stopped there for the night, for the sun had set. Now, in the Hebrew there, for a certain place, it's Vayifga Bamakom. And I'm going to talk about that here in, in just a minute, if we can just leave that up for a minute. Kind of strange. Jacob left Beersheba and set up for Haran. Why not just say he left home and went to Haran? Or why not just say he went to Haran? Sometimes in Scripture it looks like there are extra words added in here. It's like, why are these extra words here? But we all know that there is nothing extra in here, nothing wasted. Uh, so Beersheba, as we remember, was a very important place. That's where Abraham had dug a well. 
And that's where the servants of Avi Melech, the P Philistines, had filled his well back up, and he dug it back out. And Avi Melech and Picol, his commander, came and said, Hey, your people covered up my well. Now I'm going to give you these seven sheep. And he said, What's the seven sheep for? He said, As an oath to let you know that's my well. And so Picol said, Don't nobody mess with this man. So here, Abraham and Picol made an oath. They made peace. Very important. Another thing that had happened there, Isaac, after Sarah died, went back to the well, Beersheba, and there he found a lady by the name of Keturah and said, come back home. Come back home. Well, Keturah had another name before. Does anybody remember whose name she was? Hagar. Yeah. So it was Hagar. So it was this thing about reuniting again. Okay. Reunited. And sorry, I just, <laughs> boy, that just kind of came out of nowhere, didn't it? And so uh, Isaac had also dug wells, and they came along, and they filled them back up, and he dug extra wells. And the last one he dug was where Abraham had dug Beersheba, and he named the entire area there Beersheba. So Beersheba was very important to Isaac, to Abraham, and also to Joseph as well. So Jacob left Beersheba and set out for Haran. Well, what do we know about Haran? Haran was a wicked place filled with wicked people, and yet, and yet, that's where Rebekah had come from. And we know that Abraham told Eliezer, you go back to there to get a wife for my son. And Isaac, following in daddy's footsteps, said, son, you go to that place and you find yourself a wife from among my family. What's the thing going on here? I want to kind of take and turn it just a little bit. Jacob, the son of promise, left Beersheba, where his family was, where his foundation was, where he was safe, where he had everything he needed, and he went to a very wicked place. This kind of sounds like the soul's journey, doesn't it? Like God breathed life into us, and the soul that he put in us is pure, but we're sent to earth to a pretty wicked place. And we have to deal with it, and we have to do the work of redemption. So, uh, if that's, by the way, if that sounds wrong, that's pretty much what Yeshua said also. He said, you go into the world and you make disciples. You leave the promised land, you leave the place of safety, of everything else, which is reminiscent of the garden. Go out and you make disciples everywhere else. So a certain place, a certain place, set up for, he came up on a certain place. Bamakom. Paifka Bamakom. Bamakom means the place. Bamakom has already been mentioned before with Abraham. That's where Abraham took Isaac and was going to sacrifice him. And God said, don't do that. I was testing you. Okay? So where Jacob went and he spent the night, we know later became the Temple Mount. And while he was sleeping there, that's when he had the dream about the ladder coming down out of heaven, and God was standing over him, and the angels were coming up and down. And you remember what he said? This is the gate of heaven. There's something special about that place. And that's what I wanted to talk about today. But I'm not going to talk about that today. So i uh, just got to kind of move on to something else. Um. But there is one thing that I want to say about that, about him taking a journey. Let's go ahead and go to verses 15 and 16. This is part of the dream. After the dream started, God spoke to him and said, Your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. You shall spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and the south. All the families of the earth shall bless themselves by you and your descendants. Where have we heard that before? God said that to Abraham and to Isaac. And again, 
bless themselves is all about being grafted in, which you and I were talking about this morning. Remember, I am with you. I will protect you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. Now, yeah, that sounds really good, but there's something troubling about that first part of that. Your descendants shall be as dust. Didn't God tell Abraham, your descendants will be as numerous as the sand on the beach? So what's the deal here? Well, yeah, it's saying you're going to have a whole bunch of descendants, but dust, I want to take just a little different perspective on it. When God made Adam, it, said, it says he made him from the dirt of the ground. He made him from the dust of the earth. And the word for dust means the stuff that's left over. Okay? In other words, it's, it's kind of like... It, the Hebrew word there means rubbish. And so what he's saying here is, yeah, you're going to have a lot of children, but they're going to be treated terribly. They're going to be treated terribly. And as you look all throughout history of the Jewish people, we see that that is absolutely what has taken place. However, after everything is said and done, Does somebody, can I borrow somebody's body? Can I just take a bazoo real quick? Everything is said and done. God is going to restore the people of Israel. And they're going to be where they should be. Oh, you've got tabs on here. Way to go. Way to go. I want to go to one of my favorite books. And you've got this small print that's all right. Yeah, the print of a mustard seed, he said. Okay, let's see. 18, Zephaniah 3, 18 through 20. Here it is. I will gather those of yours who grieve over the appointed feasts and bear the burden of reproach because they cannot keep them. When that time comes, I will deal with all those who oppress you. I will save her who is lame, gather her who is driven away, and make them whose shame spread over the earth, the object of praise and renown. When that time comes in, I will bring you in. When that time comes, I will gather you and make you the object of fame and praise among all peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your very eyes, says Adonai. So yeah, for a while, it's for the Jewish people as it is now and has been pretty tough. Descendants is the dust of the earth. But once it's over with, what happens? They're going to spread out, and they're going to fill the earth. This is, this is God's promise. What's going to happen? Okay. So up to now, Jacob's faith was really the faith of whom? Was it his own? It's really the faith of his father and his grandfather. Okay. Because all he knew was what he had been told, and he had not been tested. He had a pretty easy life, okay? But now, with him being sent away, everything was going to change. Encountering God with the dream, he became a changed man. And then he resumed his journey. It literally, in, in Hebrew, what it says, his heart lifted his feet. He was so happy from this point. Okay, I've been kicked away from home because my brother's going to kill me, and I'm going to this terrible place. But God has given me a promise in the midst of all of this. And he, he was so happy about it. His heart, it says, lifted his feet. Boy, I really wanted to concentrate on that, but it didn't happen. Maybe next year. Maybe next year. And so he, after encountering God, he was a changed man. He resumed his journey. Resumed his journey. That just doesn't sound very, okay, I'll go on. No, he was excited. He was encouraged, and he got to Haran, and when he got to Haran, that's where he saw three shepherds and three flocks. Three shepherds and three flocks. Three shepherds. What is the Hebrew word for feet? It's ragale. Okay? The Hebrew word for three is shalosh. And I'm taking a quick bazoo here. So he was happy, and he was going to this place, his feet were lifted. 
And he got there and he throw, saw three flocks. Ragalei, Shalosh, three. There's a word for Passover, Shavuot, and Zakot. For all three of them together, it's called Ragalei, Shaloshim. So we've already got a picture here about the three great festival days where all Israel gathers together. And that's just a little side note. I kind of got excited about that when I saw it. And he got there, and he was talking to him. He said, hey, what are you guys doing? It's early. Uh, how come you're not out? I said, well, we're here gathered. We have to wait for others to get here before we can roll away the stone. Why do you suppose they had to wait for others to roll away the stone? It's a big stone. And it, the three of them couldn't do it by themselves. And not only that, in that part of the world, since everybody was like Levon, it's like, no, we don't trust each other. So to make sure nobody hijacks all the water, we're going to make sure everybody's together. But the big thing is, it was just a big stone. Back then, when you had stones over whales, we're not talking about things like, we're talking about, Big, huge stones. And something very important happens here. So they, they, they just waited. They didn't know what was going on. He said, how's Levon? Y'all know him? Yeah. And by the way, here comes his daughter. Something tremendous happens here. Genesis 29, uh, 10. And when Jacob saw Rachel, the daughter of his uncle Levon, and the flock of his uncle Levon, Jacob went up and rolled the stone off the mouth of the whale. Okay, you got three shepherds there, and they can't do it. And watered the flock of his uncle Levon. Then Jacob kissed Rachel and broke into tears. Now, here's I got this up here in yellow. Jacob went up and rolled the stone. Vayigash means that he drew near. He saw her coming. And he drew near, but she was still a distance away. It's not literally that he drew near. Something happened in his heart when he saw her. Okay, just like the first time I saw you. Something happened in my heart, and I knew that's my favorite person in this world. Vayigash Yaakov Vayagel. Vayagel. That's a word for rolled. He So he rolled a stone. There's another word for it. There's another meaning for that. He did it with joy. He saw her, and he by himself rolled that stone away. God did a great miracle, and he got to do that by himself. And then he kissed her and broke into tears. You know, I'm kind of thinking she would be the one and break into tears. Maybe I'm wrong. So... God strengthened him. Let's see. The prophet Haggai said, the joy of the Lord is your strength. So, yeah, that he was very joyful when he saw her. He's like, I'm going to move this rock and get this girl some water. So the shepherds were waiting. Jacob did it along. Great joy, and the rest is history. You know, we all know the rest of the story. But there is one event that is pivotal to the whole thing. And then this encounter with Rachel and Yes, with Laban brought about the nation of Israel and the Messiah because if Rachel had not been there, there would be no nation of Israel. So there's a great significance to what had happened. You know, water is necessary, and it's got to be clean water. In ancient civilizations, all cities were located near rivers. Do you know they didn't drink the river water? You know why they didn't drink it? It was filthy. It was nasty because when... When people had uh, regular physical occurrences, you know, like using the bathroom and stuff, they throw it in the river. But the thing about the river is, not too far away from the river, you just dig a well and there's good clean water because that part of it was clean. So they always had uh, wells, had to have it necessary for water. Um, and we also know that Abraham dug wells, Isaac dug wells. So it's a pretty big deal. Let's see. It wells. Eliezer met Rebecca. Okay. Jacob and Rachel met at a well. Moses and Zipporah met at a well. 
Uh, and Yeshua actually met someone at a well also, the lady from Samaria. And he told her the truth. All right. So here's Jacob. Keep in mind, he had been walking. And what was he told to take with him on his journey? Nothing. Take nothing. And so he's been traveling through this wilderness. He shows up. I'm pretty sure probably the first thing he'd want would be a nice cool drink of water. But he saw Rachel coming. And he had such joy that, and he got this strength and he moved that rock. Even though he was tired and weary and probably very thirsty, he put his bride first. Now, she wasn't his bride at the time, but he, I'm pretty sure he knew she was going to end up being his bride. Just like Messiah put his bride first, the nation of Israel. And so it was going to set off a, a series of events that would lead to the formation of Israel, the giving of the Torah, the bringing about uh, Moses receiving the Torah, bringing about Messiah, and bringing about also the age to come. But the three flocks that were there, three flocks, that, all they could do is just sit there. The shepherds could do nothing for them. The shepherds could do nothing for it, their flocks. They just had to sit there and wait. And I sure would like to say a lot about that, but I'm not going to. Okay. Bridegroom, bride, water, and the holy days. All wrapped up into one. It all comes in together at Messiah. So Sukkot, seven days of Sukkot. All right. And on the, each day, the high priest, talking about water, the high priest would go down to the pool of Shalom, and he would take the golden vase, and he would go back up, and he'd pour out the water. And the whole time they were going, everybody would follow the high priest down there from the Temple Mount, and they'd follow him back, and they'd be singing, With joy we will draw water out of the wells of salvation. Yeshua. Hmm. Salvation. Well, they take it back to the temple, shouting, joyful, everything else. And the Gemara, which is part of the Talmud, and I love this. The Gemara says they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And that's what the water represents. The word uh, water, Mayim, is also the same word for heaven. Okay? And I'm saying this is this is a whole thing. That's like heaven coming down to earth for a while and just filling everybody. And they were so joyful. And they were given extraordinary strength for what they were doing. And it's all linked to the age to come, every bit of it, about the time to come and the consummation of heaven and earth. And it was on this very last day, the, the uh, seventh day of Shavuot, that's when Yeshua stood up in the crowd and he said these words, John seven thirty seven and 38, during the water ceremony. Now, on the last day of the festival, Hoshana Rabbah, Yeshua stood and cried out, If anyone is thirsty... Let him keep coming to me and drinking. Whoever puts his trust in me, as the scripture says, rivers of living water will flow from his inmost being. That is a great, great blessing. But coupled with that being a great blessing, that's also a really big responsibility. That is a huge responsibility. So we get the living water from Yeshua, but from the faithful, it's also going to be pouring out to everybody else who is thirsty, like Jacob. We get weary, we get tired, we get thirsty. Same with Yeshua, as he was having to carry his cross. Tired, weary, having been beat, and in a very hostile crowd. But Yeshua put his bride first. Hebrews 12, 2 says that Yeshua endured the suffering for the joy that was to come. Just like Jacob traveling away from Beersheba to Haran. He had to endure lots of suffering. But also there was that great joy that was going to come. But the good thing is the suffering would not last for Jacob. And it certainly was not going to last for Yeshua. We know all about his crucifixion. And, and by the way, he said, I'm thirsty. And then they gave him gall to drink. Not a very nice thing to do. The suffering wasn't going to last because after he had been buried, just like Jacob rolled a stone away, 
there was another stone that was rolled away. I want to take a look at 20, Luke 23. Now it was the day of preparation, and Shabbat was approaching. The women who had come with him from the Galilee followed, and they saw a tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and perfumes, but on Shabbat they rested according to the commandment. Now on the first day of the week at daybreak, the women came to the tomb carrying spices they had prepared. They found the stone had been rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Yeshua. Is that it? all of it? Yeah, okay. Isn't it interesting? It was the women who were coming. Where were the men? He had 12 disciples who were all men. It's like, where are you guys? They were hiding. Peter had said, I'm going fishing. Hmm. I'm going to do what I did a few weeks ago. If you're watching online, where are you, men? Where are you, men? You're called to serve God. Okay. So it was women who went to the burial place, and they went in pain, they went in sorrow, and they went in tears, suffering. But it was with great joy, seeing that the stone was rolled away, they ran, and they actually became the first to proclaim the good news of Messiah Yeshua and His resurrection. Now, we all know that the world is very busy trying to roll that stone back. I just saw some of it yesterday. The world is very busy trying to roll the stone back. No resurrection. Didn't happen. It's a lie. And we know it to be true. And so, we have to have our feet lifted with joy, and we have to go, and we have to roll the stone away again. And the world keeps saying, no, no, no. And we say, yes, yes. And just like it was a huge sacrifice on Jacob's part, it's a sacrifice on our part as well. Jacob the Jew this is very important. Jacob the Jew redeemed Rachel the Gentile and Leah the Gentile and the two concubines that came along with him. The Jew redeemed the Gentiles. Okay? And now... Israel is waiting for a stone to be rolled away. Now it's our turn. Now it's our turn. We just have to make sure that it's the right whale and that we're not shepherds just sitting around as flocks saying, can't do anything. Cost him a lot of pain and suffering, but he found a lot of joy in it. And so now we have to redeem the Redeemer, not only among the Gentiles, but among the Jewish people as well. Idolatry is flourishing. Haran is all around us. The Egypt is all around us. But we keep drinking the living water. Every time we come together and we worship together, we pray together, every time we do this, we're drinking that living water so that we can pour it out to others. That's why he says don't forsake the assembling together. We all need this to work for the kingdom of God. So we have to hold firm and keep working for the kingdom. And a great day is coming for Israel because the righteous will be rising up from the nations. I want to take, I want to close it out with Isaiah 35 here. Talking about the wilderness and the barren lands. The wilderness and dry land will be glad. The desert will rejoice and blossom like a lily. It may look hopeless, but it's not hopeless. It will blossom profusely. We'll rejoice with joy in singing. We'll be given the glory of Lebanon, the splendor of Carmel and Sharon. They will see the glory of Adonai, the splendor of our God. Lebanon, Carmel, and Sharon. We all know that Lebanon is a place of Gentiles. Carmel and Sharon is the place of Israel. 
Strengthen the limp hands, make firm the wobbly knees. Say to those with anxious heart, be strong, have no fear. Behold your God. Vengeance is coming. God's recompense, it is coming. Then he will save you. Then the eyes of the blind will be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then the lame will leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute will sing. For water will burst forth in the desert and streams in the wilderness. The parched land will become a pool. The thirsty ground springs of water. In the haunt of jackals where they rest, grass will become reeds and rushes. And I love this. A highway will be there. A roadway. Who is this highway for? It's for the remnant of Israel to come back home from the nations. A highway will be there, a roadway. It will be called the way of holiness. The unclean will not travel on it. It is for the one who walks the way. Fools will not go astray. No lion will be there. No ravenous beast will go up on it. They will not be found there, but the redeemed will walk there. The ransomed of Adonai will return and come to Zion with singing, with everlasting joy upon their heads. They will obtain gladness and joy, and sorrow and sighing will flee away. Jacob, who went away all alone, is going to come back home because the stone was rolled away and the water is available. And we need to invite people to come and drink. There's a lot more that a lot more that I really wanted to say, um, but I'm going to stop there.